At the bus station in Brownsville, a Honduran woman named Luz explained why she and her 12-year-old son Kristen came to the border. She told a story of domestic violence, financial distress, extortion by gangs, and the hope to escape to a better life. Besides domestic abuse from the man with whom she was living, who was not Christian's father, she added that because she was out of work and received no support from Christian's father, she had run out of money to rent a place to live. The final blow was the collapse of a job offer. The owner of a clothing shop where she had just been hired decided to go out of business rather than pay the extortion fees imposed by a local gang. Porque por un empleo que yo ya conseguido en Honduras y fui a ver el empleo y el, a los tres días el señor me habló que no podía trabajar porque le estaban cobrando impuestos de guerra a él. Entonces él cerró su, su tienda y ya no pudimos trabajar porque tiene que pagar. Soon Louise and Kristen would be boarding a bus for Fort Worth, where they had been invited to live with a friend. Her document, Release on Recognizance, ordered her to report to U.S. immigration authorities in Dallas on July 10th. Patricia was at the parish hall in McAllen. She described what pushed her husband to decide that they and their three children must leave El Salvador. It wasn't poverty. Her husband had a good job as a graphic designer with an advertising agency. But a few weeks ago, when a 14-year-old cousin was murdered by gang members, they worried that their 13-year-old son might be next. Prácticamente nos venimos por, por los niños, más que todo por el varón, porque allá ahorita las maras están... Bueno, nosotros vivimos en una zona que se llama Soyapán. Era que te reclutaban y te ponían en prueba y todo, y te daban armas para ir a matar, ir a traer la renta. The trip was financed by a sister-in-law who lived in Los Angeles, who agreed to pay a smuggler $12,000 to bring the family of five into the United States. They had made the trip to the Texas border in four days, using taxis, vans, and inner-city bus lines. Patricia said the sister-in-law had already wired $9,000 to the smuggler. The remaining $3,000 would be paid once her husband, who was still being held by the Border Patrol, was released. Y como unos vecinos también se vinieron, entonces también quisimos probar. Ajá, ellos, ellos llegaron también, porque veníamos decididos si nos deportaban, bueno, y si no, Dios iba a permitir que estuviéramos yeah. aquí en Estados Unidos. These women and their families will soon be on buses heading for their final destinations, joining thousands of illegal immigrants who are already being released by the Border Patrol after a few days in custody. They are fanning out across the country, carrying documents that allow them to travel freely, but also order them to report to immigration authorities after they reach their destination. But it is rare that people released with such an order present themselves to the authorities. Some Border Patrol agents ruefully say the documents, which have been issued for years as part of the catch and release program that relieves pressure on the overwhelmed detention facilities, might as well be in order to disappear into the interior, where they will be low priorities for arrest.